Hello, I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson, and welcome to Arts in the City. Whether it's music or dance, theater, art or film, New York has it all. And each month on this new program from CUNY TV, we'll give you an inside look at the cultural riches that make up the fabric of life in and around New York, just like those right here in spectacular Lincoln Center. But first, if it's June, it's Tony time, when theater honors the best of the best, both on stage and behind the scenes. One of Broadway's biggest hits is Newsies, with eight Tony nominations and two wins last year. The show is still wowing audiences every night. I recently sat down at Sardi's to talk theater before and since Broadway with the Tony-nominated director of Newsies, Jeff Calhoun. I love it here. How? And Sardi's, how great to be in Sardi's, my God. Right? Legends. Right? It's true, it's Adorn true. Adorn the walls. They do. So tell me, how great is it to be Jeff Calhoun today? Oh my God! That's yeah, I'm such throwing a, that's that right such at a you. loaded question. I think you're referring to specifically, you know, right now having Newsies running at the Nederlander, and another show in town, and it's like Christmas in uh, in the spring right now. Is it's how I Christmas feel. Christmas in the spring. That's how I feel. That's a great way to put it. Uh, Newsies is just full of energy. Yeah. What a great show with an open run, no end in sight. It is, and it didn't start that way. You know, it's a real success story. It was really just done as a regional production, so uh, Disney Theatrical could have licensing, uh, could license it for stock and amateur rights. Mm -hmm. And it just ignited. The fan base kept coming, and we went from a regional theater to a limited 12 weeks on Broadway, but the audiences continued to come, and the 12 weeks became a year as of last week. But I want to go back a little bit to the roots here. Yeah. Did, did you find theater or did theater find you? That's a good question. I never thought of it like that. I know that I was a kid sitting home in Pittsburgh watching the Kel Burnett show on Saturday nights and wanting to be an Ernie Flat dancer. <laughs> and I would just say to my parents, I want to do what they're doing. And my dad was like, no, you don't. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. And so my mom took me to tap dancing class. I think your only frame of reference as a kid in Pittsburgh was on television. And so I would love the old movies with Fred Astaire and Donald O'Connor, and Gene Kelly, and Buddy Ebsen, and the list goes on and on. Dick Van Dyke, Ken Berry, all those people were great influences to me. I want to dance around here a little bit, pardon yeah, sure. the pun. No, um, so in Newsies, yeah. we see some of Tommy Toon peppered in, especially that opening number. Talk to him as your mentor. Wow, um, a lot comes to mind. First of all, just basically how to put on a show. Most of what I know about putting on a show I learned from Tommy. But in addition to that, there's a generosity of spirit that he gave me, mm -hmm. and that I feel, you know, with privilege, which we are, with pri privilege comes responsibility. This is pretty unique to have someone like Mr. Toon, perfectly accomplished, to have taken you under his wing, for lack of a better expression. Yeah, it was a godsend. It's the best professional thing that's ever happened to me. God knows where I would be without that kind of nurturing, because hmm. it is a tough business which I don't quite understand because success begets success. It's probably my favorite thing about the business is being able to help out others or picking up the phone and saying to a friend, hey, I have a job, do you want a job too? But you're really at the top right now and you can keep going higher and higher and higher. What is it that you'd like to direct? What other projects would you like to do? What's on your dance card, Jeff Calhoun? You know, I, I'm lucky that I have, I do have a dance card that takes me through the next few years, but to be honest, I just want to keep working. I feel a bit like a misfit when I'm not in a rehearsal hall or in a theater. I feel a little out of place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably a common denominator between a lot of artists that do this, misfits that find their way to the theater. <laughs> because you're young and you're expressive, and I think that stands out from other people. You're sure. doing things other people are not doing. What criteria do you use in choosing the works you're gonna direct? As silly as this answer is gonna sound, it's, it's, it's mostly it's practical. Someone will come to me with a project, and I like to work, and you need a job. Mm -hmm. And so it's as simple as that sometimes. I mean, sure. I didn't seek out newsies. Tom Schumacher picked up the phone and called me and asked me. You know, so for a director for hire, that's really how you get most of your work. But it's also the story you were passionate, I, I have to say, I Heart. would imagine. Heart is, yeah. I think, at the key of every show that I love. That I'm, that I'm attracted to. Mm -hmm. It has to have great heart. And when I saw the reading of Newsies, 
that's what stuck with me. They asked me when it was over if I really wanted to direct the show, and I said, absolutely. And Tom said, why? And I said, because it has such heart. You work a lot. Ah, thank God. You don't sleep. Even you dream it. You dream your shows. It is 24-7 for as long as, you know, I, it takes two to five years. Usually from that moment you get a job till you see it on stage. Hmm. It's a long process, so you have to love the journey. Yeah? It's a special time for me, mm. and, um, and I'm grateful. I don't take it lightly. No, clearly you I don't. don't. I don't take it lightly. But on, this, uh, on the same hand, last year, before Newsies opened, a show very dear to me called Bonnie and Clyde was not successful. And so that's what this is a business of. It's highs and lows. It's highs and, and navigating lows. through those. And I don't think you really... You don't learn from your successes. You have fun, you make money, but you learn from the failures because they make you question yourself and, and wonder and try to analyze. Yes, while Newsies, while you have hit shows running, you're very popular, but when you don't, it can be a very lonely business. Really? The phone stops ringing for months. I've seen people cross a street to avoid having to run into me after a show that didn't necessarily uh, be as successful as we'd wanted. It, oh, absolutely. So, do you know who your friends are? You absolutely do. Mm. Yeah, you absolutely know who your friends are. The ones that are there when you're not the most popular, successful director or the direct flavor of the month. Absolutely. Because everyone is there when you have a hit. Everyone asks me what I try to do. What do I want to instill in an audience? Ooh. And it's always the same answer. I feel the responsibility that when they see one of my shows and the show is over, I just want them to want to see another live show on stage again. Well, I have to say, Jeff Calhoun, it has been an honor and a pleasure to oh, spend some time you. with you it's this morning. It's been my morning. pleasure. Thank we you. We know you're very, very busy, and this thank is you. really great, and how great it is to be you right now. Well, Wonderful. this is special, and thank you for, for sharing this, really. Thank you. When you hear the name Tony Bennett, you automatically think world-renowned entertainer. But he has another passion for arts education. The Frank Sinatra School of the Arts was founded by Tony and his wife, Susan Benedetto, and was named to honor his friend and mentor, Frank Sinatra. Donna Hanover takes us inside this special high school in Astoria. Tony believes in, in the kids giving back. The school started in 2001 in two small buildings, but in 2009 it moved into a specially designed building in Astoria, Tony Bennett's hometown. Tony's wife, Susan Benedetto, who was a teacher at the school and then vice principal for a while, says they really want the students involved in the community. Especially at the high school level, kids are, you know, it's all about me. And so <laughs> we would like to encourage them to give back to their community. Um, and help others. So that's first and foremost. But secondarily, it allows them to practice their craft and gives them a chance to sort of experiment before the stakes get really high. Junior dance major Vicki McGlaris says in that discipline, they usually focus on ballet and modern dance. Has Tony Bennett ever come around it into one of your classes? Yes, he has been in our dance class a few times, which makes us want to kick it up a notch and do even better because it's Tony Bennett. Okay, what do you want to do when you finish here? What's your plan? Well, my goal is to actually become a mechanical engineer. You know, it's not too many dancers that I would talk to that would say to me, my goal is to be a mechanical engineer. Yes. <laughs> is there something about dancing and mechanical engineering, is there something in common? For me, there is. Um, for mechanical engineering, it's putting a bunch of things together, which relates hand in hand with choreography and seeing what works, what doesn't work, what fits in with the measurements, and what doesn't. Along the same lines, with neighbors like Kaufman Astoria Studios and the Museum of the Moving Image, the school decided to include film as a major. Thomas Bencivengo is a 2012 graduate who is now in college. At Sinatra, he made a documentary called Forever Young that has won a slot in the student filmmakers division of the Tribeca Film Festival. It's about uh, my f one of my best friends, uh, Nicholas Cordova. Uh, he was murdered uh, September 2010, and uh, it was just something that you never think it could happen to you. And it must be pretty emotional for you because of the topic. Oh yeah, it's uh, definitely a, um, a topic that hits home and hits my heart and my family and, and my friends. And, and the staff here, the teachers, 
helped you create a film that was worthy of the uh, Tribeca Film Festival? Yes, they're great at what they do. They're great at teaching and they're great at working with kids. It was just motivating. It was never like uh, a point where they'd be like, well, you know, you should take it easy. It was like, no, you keep working on your film, you know. Even lunch periods, I would, you know, stay there and edit because they'd let you do that. Being at Sinatra was definitely that loving push. They really, the staff here is incredible. You know, they really take you under their wing and they really, they give you that push of inspiration and motivation right out that door and into, into the career that you want to follow. Principal Donna Finn says each year 2,000 kids audition for 200 freshman slots. In this school, there's always action. We have six majors that students audition for to come to the school. We have fine arts, film, drama, dance, instrumental, and vocal music. Our mission is to prepare students for the most competitive conservatories in the country as well as the most um, comprehensive and competitive academic institutions, colleges, and universities in the nation. The principal says whether the students end up pursuing their art professionally or becoming great patrons of the arts, the idea is to develop expertise in their field. We have some students who want to be famous, but really that's not the mission of the school. Um, the idea of the school is to really develop a love and a passion of an art form, to challenge themselves, to challenge themselves, to take advantage of every opportunity, and to um, stay with it, you know, go with your heart, you know, do what you love. Judging from the quality of the programs and the talent of the students, we will no doubt see alumni of the Frank Sinatra School of the Arts gracing stages, galleries, televisions, and silver screens for many years to come. I'm Donna Hanover for CUNY TV. As we get ready to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg next month, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has opened a landmark exhibit of more than 200 photographs documenting and detailing the four years of the Civil War. We join curator Jeff Rosenheim for a private tour of this exhibit as he explains how this unfolded and the evolving role of the camera during the war. I've been wanting to do this show for a long time. In fact, I tried to do it 10 years ago. It's so much better that I did it now for all sorts of reasons. One is the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg, but also I think that we are trying to figure out who we are. We live in a time of perpetual war. I'm Jeff Rosenheim. I'm the curator in charge of the Department of Photographs, and I'm the curator of this exhibition, Photography and the American Civil War. This is an exhibition on the role of the camera during the American Civil War, which was an epic moment in American history and in the development of the medium of photography. This is one of the most famous of all the portraits in the show. It's, a, it's an image of Lincoln. It's called the Cooper Union image because when Lincoln came to the Cooper Institute or Cooper Union to give his very famous speech, he sat for this portrait for Matthew Brady on the morning of his talk. This image was duplicated in every different possible medium, as wood engravings, as tintypes, and you can see the quality of the image. It was one of the first pictures that became part of the currency of Lincoln's physiognomy. People in the East had not ever seen the candidate for the highest office in the country, and it is believed that the image led to his success as a candidate. was just 20 years old when the Civil War began. It was just beginning to figure out what it was going to do, what it needed to do to uh, record the likenesses of these individuals and the sort of landscapes of the war. It gave pictures to people who never had them, allowed people to change the course of history. This is a photograph of Sojourner Truth, who was born a slave in New York State, and we're looking at a carte de visite, and it's a small card that's about four inches by two and a half inches, and I went out of my way to show it as an object because it's this object that Sojourner Truth actually sold to raise money for the causes that she believed in. She depicts herself um, sewing women's work, the nobility of women's work. She's um, posing for a picture that would be sold to raise money for the anti-slavery, the abolitionist cause. And this object has text printed below it, I sell the shadow to support the substance. 
she believed in the power of photography to be an aspect of social change. She never learned to read or write, and yet she was one of the most powerful voices of her time. I sort of feel like photography hasn't really gotten any better. When you get up close to these things, they're filled with information. What's amazing about this picture is that this might be one of the first photographs made by a union photographer in coastal South Carolina. It might be one of the first photographs of freed African Americans who are kind of in a limbo state. They're free, but they're not emancipated. And yet they pose for this picture on board a ship uh, looking for the future and, and looking to the camera to find their way there. When we look in their faces, it's touching. There's a poignancy of seeing a soldier who doesn't know what his future is going to be, or seeing an individual, African Americans who had never been photographed before, finally their identity is being recorded by this medium, and their changed lives. This is, this is the crucible of American history. This is where American identity got its birth in a certain sense. This is an amber type. It's an image on glass in a beautiful case of two Georgia brothers who are going off to war. They're wearing different uniforms, and some people think that one's a Union officer or, and one is a Confederate, but they're brothers. The uniforms were not standardized at the beginning of the war. The fellow on the left is going to die soon after the picture. The fellow on the right is going to survive. Through their families, this picture survives. It's a beautiful picture of two brothers looking into the future, sitting for their portrait, and believing in the power of the image to protect them. I like the fact that when people come through the show, they can wander and approach a case and find their way to an object that might mean something to them. Like this object right here is extraordinary. This is a picture of a woman who posed as a man and fought alongside her husband during the war. These lockets were worn primarily by women during the war, and it's, it's amazing because the belief in the image, the belief in the power of the image is astonishing. You can see it here in this beautiful display. This show reminds us of the power of photography, the power of the camera, the importance of documentation, the beauty of the medium, and the relevance to our culture today. I can honestly say that I've been working on this for a long time, and finally seeing it in these sort of tented rooms with this sort of drama, the, the, the theatrical drama that we built, the emotional tenor, it's as exciting as anything I've ever done in my 25 years at the Met. For more information on this exhibit and related Civil War exhibits at the museum, log on to cuny.tv for a link to the museum. Just in case you think you've seen it all, we've got a lot more of what's happening in June around town and a bit more than a New York Minute. I'm Mike Gilliam. No matter what your interests are, there's plenty for you to do this summer in New York. Begin with the River to River Festival, downtown's completely free summer arts experience. Be transformed by the array of music, dance, theater, visual art, and film events by renowned artists like Laurie Anderson as well as up-and-coming performers at sites all along Lower Manhattan. Lace up your dancing shoes for what's been described as New York's most fabulous outdoor dance party. I feel like dancing. Lincoln Center's Midsummer Night Swing marks its 25th anniversary by featuring some of the greatest dance bands from New York City and around the world. And dance lessons, too. The season kicks off June 25th with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra and Wynton Marsalis. And when the swing ends, sit back and enjoy Lincoln Center's Out of Doors Festival with three jam-packed weeks of world-class music, dance, and spoken word filling the plazas of Lincoln Center. Reuben Blades and the Kronos Quartet 
are just some of the top artists you can see for free. Turn up the AC by taking advantage of the feast of exhibits inside the city's museums. Bring the family to the American Museum of Natural History and plunge into the world of whales, giants of the deep. While you're there, be part of one of nature's most exciting migrations in the IMAX movie, Flight of the Butterflies. Also, be dazzled by the spectacular space show, Journey to the Stars, narrated by Academy Award winning actress, Whoopi Goldberg at the Hayden Planetarium. Stroll east through Central Park, and while you're at the Metropolitan Museum of Art visiting the Civil War photographs, you can jump on a time machine into the 70s in punk, Chaos to Couture, the Mets look at punk's impact on fashion from the movement's birth until today. Go from safety pins and studs to the mass of vibrant light filling up the Guggenheim's Rotunda from artist James Terrell's first solo exhibit in a New York museum since 1980. Experience his groundbreaking exploration of perception, light, color, and space through art. And while you're exploring museums, don't forget the Museum of Modern Art is now open seven days a week and on Fridays. It's open free from 4 until 8 p.m. A short 30-minute subway ride from Midtown Manhattan takes you to the spectacular collections of the Brooklyn Museum. The landmark exhibit of John Singer Sargent watercolors and the gorgeous wall sculptures from the African artist Ella Natswe are must-sees. Finally, the city celebrates the summer solstice on June 21st. Thousands of yogis will come together in Downward Dog for Solstice and Times Square. Three outdoor classes are offered throughout the day. And on that same day, music makes over the entire city with Make Music New York. Discover the hundreds of free outdoor concerts taking place throughout the five boroughs. Come together with friends and family to rejoice in the start of summer. And remember, you can get more information on these events and more at CUNY.TV. Grab your popcorn, sit back and listen as our own Pat Collins tells us what we can expect from this year's summer blockbuster movies. Doing better than we With a production budget well north of $200 million, Brad Pitt's World War Z is the most expensive zombie movie ever made. Oh, yeah. Elysium, a sci-fi action film with Matt Damon, comes with social commentary about the haves and have-nots in the year 2154. A 3D battle between sea monsters and super-sized robots stars Idris Elba. With a perfect SAT score in family comedy, John Goodman's Sully and Billy Crystal's Mike enter Monsters University June 21st. The summer epidemic of sequelitis strikes with Grown Ups 2, Despicable Me 2, and The Smurfs 2. That's something. Check this out. Putting the go in Escar Go, a fast moving snail named Turbo, enters the Indy 500. That's a new one. Can't be undone. Hugh Jackman's The Wolverine claws its way into theaters in July. Damn right. Channing Tatum, playing a Washington, D.C. cop, rescues the president, Jamie Foxx, from terrorists in White House Down. Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy provide comic relief in the buddy cop comedy, The Heat. Would help me on my quest. Johnny Depp's Tonto and Army Hammer's Lone Ranger ride into town July 3rd. Justice. What I seek. I'm Pat Collins for CUNY TV. New York City has long been a destination for young artists, just like right here at Lincoln Center. So for singer-songwriter Anthony Diamato, the city is an inspiring backdrop for his intimate folk sound. We joined Anthony on New York's Lower East Side, where he shared one of his original songs. I started playing the piano before I even started uh, school. But I started playing guitar when I was in fifth grade or so, and that was when I really started to click that this was something I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, I just started adding instruments after that. I played the banjo and the mandolin, the pedal steel and harmonica. Sit there with the guitar or at the banjo or the mandolin and 
and just kind of mess around and just make sounds until something sticks, something, uh, you know, whether it's a little melody or a chord progression kind of catches in my head. And then, uh, you know, after that, I'll just do that over and over again and, and kind of sing gibberish on top of it until some words stick. And then once I've got some words, I start to figure out, you know, where the song is going, what's it about, and, uh, and I take it from there. Ready? Yeah. This is Anthony Diamato for CUNY TV. song I wrote after watching a documentary about soldiers who were returning uh, from Iraq and having a difficult time readjusting to life in America. Captain, Captain, my aim is true. I shot those men like you told me to. Said I'm pray the way we do. Captain, Captain, Fighting for, and I don't know what to feel no more, and I don't know why they bother keeping score. Cause there ain't no winners in the holy war. The payoff for me of playing music is that I, I never feel better. There's nothing like the feeling of being on stage and playing your songs for a room full of people. Your friends mean well, but they don't understand why I hide from all of them. Cause I don't trust my own two hands, and that's something they'll never understand. No, they don't. Running from, they don't know when peace will come, and they don't know why I'm banging on this drum. Cause there ain't no saviors at the bowel of a gun. You know, and the writing process too is such a, a great way to work through whatever it is that you're going through in your life at any given moment, whether it's good or bad, it just helps you process everything and, and, and make sense of your life. No, there ain't no winners in the holy war. No, there ain't no winners in the holy war. That's our show for today. For more information on any of the stories you've seen, you can log on to cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. I'll see you next month on Arts in the City.